Hi, this is Tzvi Rosen with another lecture in our online series on matrix theory. Uh, today we'll be talking about dimension and change of basis. Dimension is a term we give for the number of vectors in any basis for our vector space. Um, and what that implies is that the that every basis will actually have the same size. And we'll see why that is right now. Uh, suppose we have a, a vector space V with a basis of size n. Then we'll show that any set of vectors of size m greater than n is linearly dependent. Okay, And let's recall what that means. A set of vectors is linear <coughs> linearly dependent if there are a1 through am, not all 0, such that a1, and we'll, we'll call this set w1 through wm. So a1 through am, such that a1 w1 plus up to am wm uh, will be equal to 0. So because uh, not all of the vectors are 0, that means that some non-zero combination of these vectors gives you the zero vector. Okay, and that's called linear dependence. So we're going to call the basis up here, so the basis of size n will be v1 through vn. Um, and we'll show how we can find this linear dependency. <coughs> so we know that v1 through vn is a basis. So that means that I should be able to write uh, w1 in terms of v1 through vn. Okay, So let's write that out right now. A1, uh, let, let's give these actually slightly different names. This will be a11 v1 plus up to a1n vn. Okay. And the same will be true for every vector in the set w1 through wm. This will also have to be equal to a m1 v1 plus up to a m n v n. And you'll notice that these coefficients, the a i j's, the first index corresponds to which w I'm trying to build. And the second index corresponds to which v I'm a coefficient of. So a11 is a coefficient of v1 in the equation for w1. a23 would be the coefficient of v3 in the equation trying to build up w2. Ho hopefully that's clear. But uh, looking at this, I can reformulate this as a matrix equation. Okay, So this is really equivalent to w1 up to wm is equal to the vectors v1 up to vn this matrix will be the coefficient matrix and we'll have a11 up here uh, and this will go out to a m one, okay? Because all of these get all of this top row gets multiplied with v one. So you look what's being multiplied with v one in our system of equations. And then going down here, we get our a one n. Out to here, we have our a m n. Okay. So let's let's grab this equation. And looking at this equation, one thing we can do uh, is note what the sizes of each of these matrices are. So this is an n by m matrix. This is an n by n matrix. And this is, a, is an n by m matrix. Okay. And since m is bigger than n, this is analogous to a system with more variables than equations. OK, 
Okay. So then if I'm calling this matrix A, then the equation AX equals zero has to have non-trivial solutions because there are more variables than equations. So we have some freedom. Okay, so, so this implies that AX equals zero has non-trivial solution X. That means a solution X that is not equal to zero. Okay, well, if that's the case, then multiplying this x over here, okay, and then multiplying it on the other side of the equation as well, okay, and I'll return the equal sign here. This means that the W matrix times WM times this X vector is going to be equal to on what we have on the right hand side of the equation, which because AX equals zero and then any matrix times zero is zero, this gives us zero. Okay, so this is our uh, linear dependency. Okay. Um, so what this tells us in summary is that if I have a basis of size n, any larger set of vectors is going to be linearly dependent. Okay, how about a smaller set of vectors? We're going to claim that any set of size k less than n does not span our vector space. Okay, so again, here we're going to have v1 through vn, and here we'll take a set of vectors w1 through wm. Okay. And recall that span means that for every vector, in V, there for every, and let's give it a name, for every vector X in V, there is a formula, X equals a one W one plus up to a M W M. Okay, but if that's the case, that we can express every vector in terms of this, uh, these W's, okay, so, so we're going to say suppose the W span, I'll call this capital W, suppose W spans, then every one of these basis vectors, v, VI, is in the span of the W's. Okay, so that means we're going to have a system of equations of the following form, v1 up to vn must be equal to, I'm sorry, let's start with a uh, system of equations, then we'll translate to, matrici to matrices. So we have v1 will be equal to a11w1 plus up to a1mwm. I'm sorry, we're, we're working with K now. Oh, bummer. Here, I'll quickly correct. Okay, and here we go. Okay. Um, okay, so this will go down to VN is equal to A11 W, A, sorry, this should be A N one W one plus up to A N K W K. All right. So this just means that V each of the VIs has a formula in terms of the W WIs. 
But that can be translated into a matrix equation, just like the last set, the last setup. We have v1 up to vk, sorry, vn is equal to w1 up to wk multiplied by this matrix a11 and down here we have a k1 sorry a1k it should be and then here we have a n1 go down to here we get a n k Okay, and again, we have a similar situation. We have, this is an n by n matrix, this is an n by k matrix, and this is a k by n matrix. And uh, because k is less than n, this is another situation where we have more equations than variables, right? This, 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 uh, there are fewer rows than columns in this matrix. So, so we have fewer equations than variables, which means that we have some vector x. There exists x with ax equals 0. Okay. So multiplying that on both sides, Oh, and I should, I should add in that this is non-trivial. Okay, obviously, x equals 0 always satisfies ax equals 0, but this is a non-trivial vector. And that means that uh, this equation becomes this matrix of v, vi's is equal to times the x vector is equal to zero, okay, because the ax is zero. But this is a contradiction because we know that the vi's are a basis, which means it, um, in, in particular that it's linearly independent. So this contradicts the idea that, uh, that, v1, that the v's are a basis. And so since it, since it contradicts our assumptions, we know that we made a false assumption somewhere. Uh, and this is that false assumption. Okay, so we conclude that um, W does not span. Let me make a little room for that conclusion. So we've learned that if the set is too big, it's not going to be linearly independent, i.e. it will be linearly dependent. If the set is too small, it's not going to span, which means that the only sets that are bases, um, which, is, which are the sets that are both linearly independent and span, must have size n. Okay, And that's going to lead us to the definition of dimension. So this is this, uh, so if v is a vector space, If a finite basis exists, okay, then let's call this basis B, then dim V, which we read as the dimension of V, is the size of B. Okay, so we should take care to note that a finite basis does not always exist. Does not exist for every vector space.
And uh, vector spaces that don't have a finite basis are called infinite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, and an example of that would be the space of functions on, on the real numbers. Okay. Okay. There's a perfectly reasonable vector space to define there, but it's not going to be finite dimensional. Okay. Let's consider uh, an example of a vector space and talk about what its dimension will be. Well, Rn, so this is the, as we know, is the set of tuples of numbers, real numbers that look like a1 up to an, ai real. Okay, and I can name a specific basis for this, uh, specifically a standard basis. So e1 up to en is. In other words, you have the first one is 0 down to 0. OK, and same idea over here, 0 down to 0, then 1. OK, so just the, the ith coordinate is the only one which is 1, and the rest are 0. So this is a basis for Rn. OK, and since it's a basis for Rn, that means that the dimension of Rn is uh, perhaps unsurprisingly n. Okay, But keep in mind that that means that every basis of Rn will have size n. And there are lots and lots of bases of Rn has size n. OK. So now that we have a sense that all bases will have the same size, um, and that size is called the dimension, I want to talk more about building bases. So if you're given a vector space and you want to get a basis, what should you do? So we assume you start with some set of vectors. If it's empty, the empty set, that's also fine. So whatever starting set you've got, you ask yourself, is this set linearly independent? Okay, The set of vectors that you have, is that linearly independent? If it's not, then what you should do is find a vector which is in your list, which is in the span of the other vectors, and drop it. Okay, And then you'll get a smaller list, but now it has a better shot at being linearly independent. And you check again. Okay, so then you go back here. Okay, So if you're still not linearly independent, find another vector in the span of the others. Okay, whenever there is a linear dependency, that means that one vector is in the span of the others. So eventually, you're going to get out of this loop, and all of your vectors will be linearly independent. Then we can ask, does your set of vectors span the vector space? Okay. If it doesn't, that means that there's some vector in the vector space which is not in the span. Okay, and what you can do is just take that vector and put it into your list. Okay, and that won't introduce any linear li linear dependencies. Okay, your your new set will still be linearly independent. Okay, so then you can go back and see if it spans now. Um, if it if it doesn't, then you're still you're missing more vectors. So you go back to look for another vector and you add it in. If it does, then we have arrived at the final step where we know it's a basis, right? Because it's linearly independent and it spans. So we're done. Let's see this plan in action. Let's complete a basis of R3 uh, by finding a basis which contains this given vector 3 minus 1, 4. OK. so. 3 minus 1, 4 is a single vector. So it, when I ask myself, is this linear, linearly independent, uh, the answer is going to be yes, unless it's the 0 vector. The only vector which is not linearly independent 
at just as a single element is the zero vector. So, so this set is linearly independent. Okay, so does this span R3? Okay, so there's a lot of ways to know that it doesn't. The easiest way is because it's only size one, right? A, a, a spanning set of R3 has to have size at least three. So not big enough. So let's find some vector which is not in the span. Okay, and it's not hard. Basically, any vector which isn't a linear, which isn't a multiple of uh, three minus one four, is going to be outside of the span. So let's take an easy one. One zero. Let's write, write it like this. One zero zero. It's not in span, so we can add it in. Okay, now our new set is 3 minus 1, 4, and 1, 0, 0. Now we ask, does this span? And the answer is, no, it's still too small. So what we'll do is we'll look for another vector which is not in the span of these two vectors. Okay, so this part might be a little bit more difficult. So find v not in the span. Of, uh, not, not in the span of what we have so far. I noticed that um, the last two coordinates in both of these vectors are either both zero or both non-zero. So my hunch is that if I take only one of them to be zero and the other one not, uh, then that's not in the span. So my guess would be that um, zero, one, zero is not in the span. Okay, and you can confirm that. Just to confirm, if it were in the span, we would have a times three minus one, four. Plus b times one, zero, zero equals 0, 1, 0. OK. Well, from, uh, so, so just doing the math here, we have, doing the arithmetic, we have 3a plus b minus a, 4a equals 0, 1, 0. So the, this coordinate indicates that a must be negative 1, because if minus a is 1, a is negative 1. Whereas this one would tell us that 4a equals 0, so a must be 0. So that presents us a contradiction. Okay, So that means that it's not in the span. OK, which is good. And so we've completed our basis. Right? We found three linearly independent vectors. And we can confirm also that they span. So we have right now, so our basis, three minus one, four, one, zero, zero, and zero, zero, one. Okay, and let's just confirm that it spans. So, sorry, this should be zero, one, zero. So for example, this will be a little sanity check. Is zero, zero, 001 in the span of these other three? 
Uh, and you can see right away that it is because you can take uh, a quarter of the first vector. Okay, that, me that sets the last coordinate to, to one. And then you just add the other, the other vectors to cancel out uh, the stuff going on um, in the other two coordinates. So we have minus 3 quarters v2 and plus 1 quarter v3. Okay, and that gives us an expression for 0, 0, 1. And we know that 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0 together with 0, 0, 1 spans the whole space. So clearly we span everything. So this is a basis. Okay. Uh, now we're going to try to trim a basis. So we, we want to ask if the set of vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, minus 4, 1, and 2, 4 contains a basis of R2. So uh, following the flowchart from a few slides ago, uh, we're going to check if the vectors are linearly independent. Uh, and drop any vector that's in the span of the others, or drop some vector which is in the span of the others. So clearly, the set is too big, so it's definitely li linear, de linearly dependent. Okay, so any basis has size two. Therefore, a set of size four is too big. So let's find some vector which is in the span of the others. Uh, we'll label these v1, v2, v3, and v4, just for uh, convenience. So the first thing I'm, I notice right off is that v4 is twice v1, which means that v4 is in the span of the other vectors. So I can drop it. Okay. So I'm left with v1, v2, and v3. Now looking at v1, v2, and v3, if I, um, if I multiply, so, so we're going to, to see if one of these is in the span of the others. In particular, we're going to say, so let's take a v1, a1, 2, plus b3, 4. Does this include uh, 1? Can this be made to equal 1 minus 1? So this is a uh, matrix equation, really. This is the matrix equation one, two, three, four. a, b equals 1 minus 1. Okay, and uh, one way to get a solution is just to uh, multiply by the matrix inverse. So we get a, b equals minus a half times uh, You swap the diagonal entries, so we get 4, 1, and you negate the off diagonal entries, minus 1, minus 2, and then you multiply that by the other side. Uh, and what we get is, I'm just carrying this over, that this is equal to 4 plus 3, or 7. It's minus a half times 7. And in the bottom corner, we have minus 2. Minus 1 is minus 3. So this tells us that 1 minus 1 is equal to minus 7 halves times 1, 2 plus 3 halves of 3, 4. Okay, and you can confirm that, right? In the top coordinate, we have minus 7 halves plus 9 halves is, is positive 1. The bottom coordinate, we have minus 7 halves times 2 is minus 7, plus 3 halves times 4 is 
6, so that's minus 1. Okay. So indeed, 1 minus 1 is in the span of the other 2, so we can drop it. So drop it. And we're left with 1, 2, and 3, 4. Uh, I'll list it this way, 1, 2, and 3, 4. Um, and these are linearly independent. Uh, in terms of the question of whether it spans, they do span. Um, and I'm going to leave for later how I know this, these span. Uh, these span. Therefore, since they're span, they span and they're linearly independent, they're a basis. Okay, let's do one more example. So now we want to compute the dimension of a subspace of R4. So what is the dimension of the subspace of R4 spanned by the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, the vector 2, 2, 2, 0, then 0, 0, 0, 3, and 3, 3, 3, 4. Okay, so here we want to know um, basically how many vectors out of this set span the whole set of vectors. Okay, so first thing to do is look for linear dependencies. So I noticed that the first vector is all ones, the second vector is has the first three coordinates the same, and the third vector has the second, the, the, the last coordinate the same. So if I'm labeling this v1, v2, v3, and v4, uh, it's not hard to see that 3v1, or you know what, let's make it 6 just so that it's easier. 6v1 is equal to 3v2 plus 2v3. Okay. So this tells me that v, and I can just divide everything by 6. So that gives me 1 half v2 plus 1 third v3. And this tells me that v1 is in the span of the other, so I can drop v1. Okay. Um, so v2 and v3, I like that they have a lot of zeros, so I want to hang on to them. But let's look at v4. So here again, we have the first three coordinates the same, and the last coordinate different. So v4 looks like um, 3 halves times v2 plus 4 thirds times v3. So I can drop v4 as well. Okay, and what am I left with? v2 and v3. Um, are these linearly independent? They are. So are linearly independent. Okay, and since we're just interested in the subspace they generate, so they, they obviously span their subspace because that's the subspace we're using. So plus span their subspace. So that means it's a basis for its subspace, which means that its subspace has dimension 2. Right, because it's the size of any basis. Here are two facts I added last minute to these slides. Um, and one of them is how I was able to determine just by looking at it that a certain uh, set of vectors was spanning. The first uh, fact is that any set of n linearly independent vectors also spans. Okay, so if it's size n, so it's the size of the dimension, big enough to be a basis, um, and we know it's linearly independent, then it's also going to span. So how do we know this is true? Well, we proved that any uh, set bigger than n is linearly dependent. So any set of n plus 1 vectors is linearly dependent. Um, so if I take any vector in the vector space, so 
call it x, and add it then the result must be linearly dependent. But then just looking at that linear dependency, we can read off a recipe for x in terms of the other vectors. This shows how to build x using, let's call these v1 through vn, using v1 through vn. Okay, so that tells us, but by using that linear dependency that you get from adding anything in, I'm able to come up with a recipe for my new vector in terms of the basis vectors. Okay, and there's a similar argument to show that any spanning set of n vectors is linearly independent. Okay, suppose not. Okay, so suppose we have some spanning set of n vectors and it's linearly dependent. Okay, well then I should be able to throw away one of the vectors without changing the span. Can throw away some vector which is in the span of the others. Without changing the span. But now you have a set of n minus 1 vectors. But a set of n minus 1 vectors cannot span. So my supposition, my assumption earlier that the set of vectors is linearly dependent must have been false. So the vectors must be linearly independent. Okay. Now we want to consider change of basis. Okay, so we've established that vector spaces can have bases, different bases. Um, okay, all of them have the same size. Uh, but what if we have some vector and we've described it in terms of our standard basis and we want to describe it in terms of a different basis? Okay, so we have w, which is equal to a1 times our first standard basis vector up to an times our second, or, or times our last. Uh, basis vector, and we want to turn that into um, a different formulation. So it'll be equal to b1v1 plus up to bnvn. Well, what we have is uh, really a, uh, a matrix equation. We have on this side our standard basis vectors. We have 1, 0, all the way down to 0. 0 down to 1, and 1's on the diagonal. Really, there's just zeros here. Okay. And that correspond, and then we'll be multiplying that by a1 through an. Okay, that's what we have on the left hand side of the equation. Let me make this look a little nicer. So just 1's on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. And now we want this to be equal to v1 up to Vn times B1 through Bn. Okay? And what we're trying to do is solve for the Bi's. But in a matrix equation like this, it should be relatively straightforward to solve. We just need the inverse matrix to this. So if this is our, a matrix, let's call it M, so we can multiply both sides by M inverse. So m inverse times, we can ignore the identity matrix and just have this vector will be equal to m inverse times m is the identity, so we can throw that away and just get b1 through bn. Okay, 
So in order to change basis from the standard basis to um, this basis of v's, you're going to want to multiply by the inverse matrix to the matrix of v's. Let's see this in action. So we have the example uh, in R2, so just uh, two-dimensional space. We want to express 3, 1, and that's given in our standard basis, in terms of the basis 4, 1, 5, 9. Okay? So just to recall the setup, we're saying 3, 1 is going to be equal to 4, 1, 5, 9 times these uh, coefficients b1, b2. Uh, and so all we have to do is multiply by the uh, inverse matrix of m. This is our m. So let's compute m. m inverse is 1 over the determinant, which is 36 minus 5, or 31. And the matrix here is going to be swap the diagonal and negate the off diagonal. Uh, and that should be it. Okay. So then uh, what's left, we just multiply that on both on both sides of the equation on the left-hand side. So we have uh, b1, b2, assuming that the inverse matrices cancel, will be equal to 1 over 31 times 9 minus 5 minus 1, 4, times 3, 1. And doing out the multiplication, we get... So 9 times 3 is 27, minus 5 is 22, so that's 22 over 31. And then we have minus 1 times 3 is minus 3, plus 4 is 1, so that's 1 over 31. And uh, what this means for us is that 3, 1 is equal to 22 over 31 times 4, 1 plus 1 over 31 times 5, 9. Okay. And just to do the quick computation, make sure this is correct, we have 22 times 4 is 88, plus 5 is 89, divided by... Sorry, plus 5 is 93. Um, so uh, divided by 3, divided by 31 is 3, so we're good. Uh, and then we have 22 plus 9 is 31, divided by 31 is 1. So that checks out. Okay. Um, another way of saying this is if this is our basis B and this is the vector V, so we could say that V, the coordinate with respect relative to the basis B, are given by. Uh, 22, 31 over 31, 1 over 31. Okay? It's another way of writing the same idea. Okay, let's express the polynomial 1 plus x plus 2x squared in the form a times x minus 1 squared plus b times x minus 1 plus c. Okay, so this looks a little tricky, but really it's the same type of problem. We have p2 as the vector space of polynomials of degree at most 2. So uh, so this is polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2. So this has a standard basis, which is 1x and x squared. These are like the e1, e2, and e3. And what we're saying is let's give it a different basis. Specifically, this will be our v1 our v2 and our v3. Okay? So what we do is we write out v1, v2, and v3 in terms of our standard basis. So we're, we want to say 1 plus x plus uh, 2x squared is, is basically, um, you know what, I, this is going to get confusing to me if I, if I don't do it like this. x squared x1, and we'll name these e1, e2, e3. And we have 1, 1, sorry, this should be 2, 1, 1 as the polynomial in the standard basis, right? Because we have 2x squared plus x plus 1. 
And I want to expand this in terms of these vectors. So our v1 is now the x minus 1 squared. That corresponds to 1 minus 2, 1. Because it's x squared, that's 1 times x squared, minus 2 times x, times x plus 1. And now we have x minus 1, so that's 0, 1 minus 1, because you have 0 x squared term. And in the last, we have uh, c, which is our uh, 1. Okay, And this is going to be multiplied by our b1, b2, b3. OK, so here we have the matrix M is a little bit more complicated. We can't just use a formula. So we're going to use our standard tool for um, computing a matrix inverse, which is putting it next to the identity matrix and, and uh, doing row operations. So to find M inverse, let's write this down. Let's find M inverse. So we're going to copy this matrix. Oops. Okay, and we're going to put this next to um, the identity matrix. And now we're going to do row operations until we get uh, the identity on the left. And this is actually an easy-ish case because it's, uh, upper, it's uh, lower triangular, so we can add twice row 1 to row 2, and uh, minus row 1 to row 3. And that gives us 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then on the, on the right-hand side, we get um, 1, 0, 0. And then we added 2 here, 2 and 1, 0. And we added minus 1 here, 0, 1. OK. And we have one row operation left to do, which is add row 2 to row 3. And we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And we added row 2, so it's going to be positive 1, 1, 1. OK? So this is our inverse matrix on the right here. And taking that matrix, so this is our M inverse. So we're going to learn that B1, B2, B3, or rather here we had, uh, I really should have put A, B, and C. This is going to be given by one, two, one, 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 one times two, one, one, which was the uh, vector we started with. And what we get is two on top, then two, two times two plus 1 gives us 5. And the sum of all 3 is 2, 3, 4. So our polynomial 2x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to 2 times x minus 1 squared plus 5 times x minus 1 plus 4. And this can actually be useful in calculus when you're doing working with uh, Taylor series and stuff, but we're not going to go into that. OK, so we learned how to do how to change from uh, the standard basis to a non-standard basis. But the, if we want to do from a, both non-standard, it's, it's quite the same, right? So instead of starting with just um, Instead of having you know, a1 through an in the standard basis is equal to this new basis, v1 through vn times b1 bn. Now we have non-standard bases on both sides. We have w1 through wn 
a1 through an. And then v1 through vn times the, the b's. So if you want to solve for either one of these, you just multiply by, by whatever matrix inverse isolates it on that side of the equation. So if this is our inverse, if this is our matrix, let's call this one m1 and this one m2. Um, so if we want to find what the b's are, so or if we want to find what the a's are, multiply both sides by m1 inverse. Okay, and to find b's, multiply by m2 inverse. Okay. So in particular, your b's will be equal to m2 inverse times m1 times your a's. Okay. So if we want to call, th this can sometimes be called, uh, this matrix can be called p from b1 to b2, okay, because it translates coordinates in, in basis, relative to basis 1 into coordinates relative to b2, okay? And if you want to go the other way, if you want to solve for the a1s, so a1 through an, this is equal to m1 inverse times m2 times b1 through bn. So this will be p translating from b2 to b1. So let's see this in action. Let's find the change of basis matrices for polynomials to go from the, the basis b, which is x plus 1 squared x plus 1 and 1, to b prime, which is x minus 1 squared x minus 1 and minus 1. Okay? So it might seem a little scary, but again, we just have to spell everything out in terms of the equations we set up before. So in terms of a standard basis, the B matrix looks like 1, 2, 1, okay, because it's x squared plus 2x plus 1. And then we have 0, 1, 1 for x plus 1, and 0, 0, 1. And uh, so this will be by whatever a's we want. Okay, so this is our basis, this is our, ba this corresponds to basis B. And then here we would have 1 minus 2, 1, 0, 1 minus 1, 0, 0 minus 1. Okay, and this is our B prime, B prime going to B1 through Bn. Okay. Well, if we want the change of basis matrices, we need inverses for both of these matrices. I already computed, uh, actually not quite, so let, let's, uh, let's compute these inverses. So we have uh, the inverse for B. So B inverse uh, is going to be the matrix that we get after doing uh, working with this lower triangular matrix. So you know what? Let's, let's just do this on a new slide. So let's compute B inverse. So we get 1, 1, 1 here. So it's minus 2 R1 plus R2 and minus R1 plus R3. So we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and uh, 0, 1, 0, minus 2, 1, 0, and then we get 0, 1, 1. Uh, minus 1, 0, 1. Okay, next step is minus R2 plus R3. 
and we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 2, 1, 0. And in the third row, we have 0, 0, 1. And now minus, two, minus of minus 2 is 2, plus minus 1 is 1. And then minus 1 and 1. Okay. So that means that B inverse is equal to 1 minus 2, 1, 1 minus 1, 1, and completing the picture. And how about B prime inverse? So we need to take the matrix from here. very similar to this matrix, but different in important ways. And we're going to compute the inverse of that. So we take twice row 1, add it to row 2. And minus r1 to row 3, we get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 2, minus 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, and the next step will be to add row 2 to row 3. So row 2 plus row 3 gives us 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. Uh, I'm sorry, this should be, uh, should be down here row 2 plus row 3. Uh, 1, 2, 2, and then 2 plus minus 1 is 1, so that becomes 1, 1, 1, and zeros up here, and a final 1. And now we have to multiply the bottom row by minus 1 times minus 1 gives us 1, 1, 1 on the left, and on the right, 1, 2, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay, so this is, this is our um, inverse matrix for B prime on the right. Okay, so to summarize, so the B inverse matrix is equal to this one. The B prime inverse matrix is equal to this one. So to go from the basis P, to go from the basis B to B prime, you take B prime multiplied by, sorry, this should be uh, yeah, so you, you multiply by B prime inverse and then by B. So this will be equal to um, In our case, we have B prime inverse is as it's written here. Then B is written as uh, the one over here. Okay, so this is B, and this is B prime inverse. And you multiply those two together, and you get the change of basis matrix, which is uh, annoying to compute, but we'll do it. So it's 1 over here. Actually, it's not as annoying because I know it's upper triangular because that's, or sorry, lower triangular because that's always closed under this operation. Um, OK, so the 2, 1 entry is going to be 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2, so that's 4. And then the, this entry is 1. And uh, the 3, 1 entry is going to be minus 4. Next one is minus, sorry, uh, yeah, minus 2. And the next one is minus 1. 
Okay, so that's the matrix you would multiply by to take your coordinates relative to, to basis B and convert them to uh, coordinates relative to basis B prime. As for the other one, so we to get uh, from B prime to B, oops, you would multiply by the matrix corresponding to um, B inverse and then by B prime. Okay, and so B inverse is this matrix. And B prime, uh, B prime is up here. Okay, and multiplying these through, we get these are actually quite similar to each other. B inverse and B prime, but not not exactly. And, okay, so we get, uh, again, this is going to be upper triangular, 1, 0, 0, 0 over here. Uh, this one is minus 2, minus 2, so that's minus 4. And we have 1 over here, and we have 4 over here, minus 2, and minus 1. Okay, and so this is the matrix you would multiply by to change uh, B prime to B. So it's kind of interesting. I have a matrix which would change me from B to B prime and another one that would change me from B prime to B. So what would you expect to happen if I multiply them? Well, I should change back to what I started with, right? B prime, B, if B goes to B prime and then B prime goes to B, that should be what, back to what you started with. And let's confirm to see that that's actually what happens. So the top left, so obviously this is upper triangular again, or sorry, lower, I keep saying that. This is lower triangular. So then we get uh, one in the top left, four minus four in the next entry, so that's zero. Um, in this two, two entry, we get uh, one times one, so that's one. In the three, one entry, we get minus four plus eight, minus four, so that's zero. Uh, then in the next entry, the three, two entry, we get minus two plus two is zero. And in the final entry, we get one. And indeed, we're, we're left with the identity matrix, okay? Because the change of, matri the change of basis matrices, going from B to B prime, going from B, pr B, time, B prime to B, are naturally inverses to each other. Okay, hopefully uh, you have better sense now for bases and dimension and how to change from one basis to another. Um, thank you so much for your attention.